Nichols. My son is Brady Ellison, and he is a four-time Olympian in the sport of archery. My name is Keisha Bishop, and my son is Noah Lyles, who is in track and field. So congratulations to all of you. I don't know what it's like to have an Olympian. <laughs> Most of us probably never will. Um, so Sherry, why don't I start with you? I mean, does this moment feel surreal to you? I haven't even quite wrapped my head around the fact that she's there. And it was, it was always been a dream in our house, but we just didn't think it was going to happen this quick. And I think even for her, she's still having a hard time wrapping her own head around it. Every step as we go through this process, we're like, oh my gosh, she's an Olympian. Katie, who is 15, is the youngest out of all of them. <laughs> and I just had a chance to talk with her. Um, how do you think she's handling all of this? I think she's actually doing a really good job. We do talk to her on a daily basis and she's having a lot of fun. She's sharing oatmeal with Katie Ledecky every morning and she's just, it's just been an unbelievable experience for her. I'm trying to think of what I was doing at 15. I was like trying to get a license. It was like, you know, maybe running for student council president. Like I just can't even <laughs> remember. So it seems like, um, Julie, you're the pro here amongst all of us. <laughs> Tell us about, about Brady and how this feels for you, even though you've been here before. It's still exciting. So bummed we can't go. And I feel for the families, you know, first time Olympians and you don't get to be there. And, you know, that's what we've been doing for the past 16 years. We're so excited for him. You brought up a really good point, Julie, about not being able to be there. It's heartbreaking um, that you, your athletes, you know, most of us that are on this Olympic journey, it's not something that your child has done for six months or a year. It's something that they've done for a while and you're traveling with them, you know, you're schlepping them all over the country, going to all these different events and everything. And you're you so look forward to it and then COVID happens and they postpone the games and that was hard and you know scrambling to keep our reservations for everywhere our hotel and everything because having done this before we know that you have to find your hotel i mean we get all of our reservations and everything the year before and we just go on faith that brady's going to make the team um and we get all we do everything you know a year in advance so the hotel was great. Um, we were at the Sheraton uh, by Tokyo Disneyland. So we were really looking forward to that. And um, and so they kept our hotel reservations, just moved it, you know, we were all crossing our fingers. And then when they came out and said no foreign spectators, it was, oh, you know, we were so disappointed. And I just, I feel for all those first time athletes that have worked so hard to get there and their family can't be in the stands, you know, they're, and the parents who have been there through everything, you know, taking them everywhere for this dream, and they can't be there. And you can talk to them on the phone, but it's just not the same. And it's just, I just feel for them. You know, even with us being would have been our fourth ones. It's still heartbreaking to us. Keisha, your son is officially an Olympian. How does it feel for you as a mom, especially knowing all that's happened behind the scenes to get here? Yeah, it is really surreal, which I think is a word a lot of us moms are using. Um, this has been a dream of his and his brothers. His brother didn't make the team, unfortunately, but it's been a since they were in eighth grade. So it's been over 10 years. They've been pursuing it. He made the Olympic trials as a high schooler and just missed the team by one spot. So now we're here five years later and we made the team and it feels like such a weight has fallen off of our shoulders because it's just been something we know we can do, but just executing it is totally different. So it's really exciting and surreal. How does it feel uh, knowing that you won't be able to be there in person? You know, I am okay with it. If you had asked me this a year ago, I would have been devastated. But based on everything we've been through in the past year and a half, I am just so excited that we actually get to have the games. Like, I don't care if I have to watch it from my bedroom or wherever. It's like, I just want them to compete safely. And, you know, I don't want anyone to get sick, but I'm still just as excited. 
tell me about your the, the training and what goes into it and what pu- people don't see at home as far as how hard your kids work. We're up every morning at 4 a.m. I slept on the back seat of my van um, for mornings for years now as I drop my kids off at the pool and I and I sit in the parking lot at five in the morning for a couple of hours. And then, you know, they're back again in the afternoon, they have weights in between that. And that's, you know, six days a week, sometimes seven days a week. And um, I I don't even think that my own family quite understood the rigorous workouts and sacrifices that they've made and, and what the purpose was for all of that over the last 10 years until this moment, then they're like, Oh, okay. Now we see why they're a little crazy with this whole swim stuff. (laughs) Sherry, I am so happy. You just mentioned that there are a lot of moms, including myself and dads who, you know, I have to take my boys to soccer practice twice a week. And I'm like, Oh, (laughs) (laughs) you just said that you're up at 4am, sometimes six days a week, sleeping in the back of your van while they practice and then coming back and doing it again later in the day. Really? Yes. And for you, Julie, how has it been growing up with Brady? Brady is my only. He actually moved out to the Olympic Training Center when he was 16. So we we took him and we dropped him off and he was like, bye, see ya, you know. And so he he did online school. And um, and so that's, you know, he, he left home and that that was what he wanted to do. And, you know, they trained eight hours a day and, and now, um, you know, people just don't realize, or when he's home in Arizona, you know, they'll like, they want to pull him away. And he's like, you know, I'm, I'm training. I, I, this is my job. I have to do this. It's not my hobby. People still think that what he does sometimes is a hobby. We're like, no, it's, it's not a hobby. And he travels over 200 days out of the year. He and his wife for the archery they travel all over the world to compete so it's it's hard it's it's a grind we drove all over the place you have to drive across country you're flying everywhere it's just it's a lot you know i think it's important for people to hear all the work so that when they see them you know front and center on on an international spotlight they'll understand what it took to get there more americans watch nbc news than any other news organization in the world It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope, the COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now, it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. Good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. Tisha, you ran track too, right? I did. I like to say I ran track BC before children. I'm <laughs> six pounds lighter. <laughs> so I have a total of seven kids. We're a blended family. I have three biological. I just be married a couple of years ago, but uh, so together we have seven. Our youngest is 21, but I think what people don't see is that it is a lifestyle. It's not something that's just a hobby. It's a lifestyle and it becomes a family lifestyle because people have to sacrifice so much, like Sherry was saying, sleeping in the car. And 
Um, you know, we have a lot of similar stories, but I think one thing that people don't get is the pressure and the expectations because they only see the excitement. Oh, you've made the Olympic team. This is so exciting. Oh, we see you on TV, you're in a commercial. But the physical, mental, and emotional pressure and expectation can be really difficult to manage. And that's where your team has to come in. You know, it's not just the athlete. For us, Noah has a sports psychologist, a family therapist, nutritionist, chiropractor, massage therapist, coach, agent. So yeah, <laughs> so we are a whole team. And then um, whenever we go somewhere, whenever he travels to a big meet, our whole family goes, you know, myself, my husband, his sister, um, his uncle, his grandmother, we really try to support him as much as possible. And after the Olympic trials, I was in bed for a week because I was so exhausted. <laughs> I can only imagine, how do you deal with that, the mental health aspect of it? I mean, he has therapists, he has you know other professionals in his life, but your mom. So the way I deal with it is I make sure I stay in contact with my therapist <laughs> <laughs> so that I can keep my tank filled and overflowing. Because what's in the tank is for me, but what's overflowing is for everyone else. So if I'm not overflowing, I have nothing to offer him. And when we go to the Olympics or the Olympic trials or world championships, we put ourselves in a bubble. We ignore social media. We ignore text messages and we just stay focused on the goal at hand and we don't try to get wrapped up in anything else because we're there just to grind it out and and to meet a goal and julie i read for you i thought you try not to hover which would be very difficult for, i can only imagine i try not to hover because when brady first started i was your helicopter mom that you read all the bad stories about and he would tell me mom you need to go watch the girls go to the other side of the field you're stressing me out and so now when we go i'm like I love you. Good luck. You know, shoot good. And then I usually visit with everybody. I pay attention to what he's doing. You know, we watch everything, but it, it, we've been doing this for a long time now. So I try not to hover because that affects them. This whole Olympic journey is something else. So if I were to ask you, Sherry, what has been the most challenging in this journey and the most rewarding so far, what would you say? Well, the most challenging right now is just not being there with her. Um, you know, I was thinking back the other day, I think that she has been to one meet um, in her lifetime of swimming by herself without a family member. Uh, I mean, we were usually at all the meets and um, for not this last season, but the season prior, she had her brother on the team with her. So her brother would be with her and she's way wiser beyond her years. She's a pretty grounded little girl. Gosh, there's been so many highs with this whole swimming. I mean, we had four of our, the younger four of our kids were swimmers and, and her two brothers went on to swim collegiately and, I think that one of the highest moments with swimming was to have all three of them together at just a little local June age group meet. Um, they were all swimming that our oldest college swimmer had been come home for the summer and he thought, well, I'll just go with you guys and swim as an exhibition. And it was just the best time as a family, having those three together swimming at the same meet. Cause that's never really happened before because of their age difference. And it was just, it was just one of those great moments. And, you know, again, going to Olympic trials with our older son in 2016 and having his two younger siblings there supporting him. And then the tables were turned this time. And our, our son has finished his swimming career collegiately and he was able to come down and now watch the two younger ones at trials. It was just, it was just a full circle moment for us. And it was just really exciting. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope, the COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine.
I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. And good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. Let's go. And good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. What are you guys feeding these children? I'm over here. Like, I like you as cook. I like you for not tater tot kids. It is crazy how much I spend cooking in the kitchen. Kate's been homeschooled since kindergarten, and all of my kids. She's the youngest of seven. And so I, I feel like that's all I do is cook. Uh, so her being gone, I'm kind of experiencing the empty nest syndrome right now. What's your go-to meal? I feel like they might need calories, huh? Lately, our go-to meal has been chicken, vegetables, on rice. And, you know, we've been doing a lot of that with Katie. But yeah, it's always been chicken and vegetable and either rice or beans or, but oatmeal has been a huge staple in our house. I think they eat it twice a day, once at 4.30 in the morning. And then again, when they get back from practice in the morning and yeah, even our kids that go away to college, you think they'd be tired of oatmeal and they're like, I can't wait to come home and have dad's oatmeal. They just <laughs> crave it. <laughs> Man, I want to try that oatmeal. What is it? Brown sugar in there or something? Why? I don't know. He puts chia seeds and all sorts of ground nuts and, and yeah. That's how you know I'm not an Olympian. I'm like, does he put brown sugar? You're like, oh, chia seeds, of yeah. course. <laughs> <laughs> and what about for you, Keisha? Noah lives in Florida and I live in Maryland. Um, he actually signed and went professional as a senior out of high school and moved to Florida and didn't know how to cook. So he has a chef <laughs> that comes wow. in and cooks his meals because he does not know how to cook and he wasn't doing a good job with cooking. So I had to make sure his meals were nutritious. But when he was in high school, we used to go through three gallons of milk a week. I felt like I lived in Costco. Um, Cause for dessert, his siblings, well, he and his siblings liked um, cereal. So Noah's favorite cereal is Raisin Bran Crunch. And he's still addicted to Raisin Bran Crunch. That's like his dessert. That's exciting for him to get to eat that because it's a little bit sweet. I, say, I can relate to you, Sherry, because I used to homeschool. And I remember those days of homeschooling. And every morning I would start out by giving my kids, I would juice for my kids mm -hmm. and give them like barley juice and all of that. And, and I felt like I lived in the kitchen. So Sherry, I totally get you. <laughs> what is barley juice? Carrot juice is really sweet. So you add the barley greens in there and it, it tastes wow. pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. They have a smoothie, power greens, berries. It's to get their greens in them. It's a great way to get a big dosage of greens in their diet. I know. Sherry, I think we have to connect after I'm this. Yeah. This is why I do these things. And, and, you know, and you too, Julie, because we think we know, but we don't, I'm sure. You know, Noah, by the way, I should say, wrote this beautiful letter, uh, Keisha, about you and all you guys have been through. Talk for people who don't know, tell us a little bit about your journey, what you guys have been with. He has asthma. Yeah, we've been through a really rough journey. Thank God we're through that. But um, I have been married to my first husband for 13 years and I had been a stay at home, homeschooling mom during that time. So when I divorced, even though I had a college degree because I attended Seton Hall University on a track scholarship, 
I did not have the experience to match my age. So I had to start out working at entry level jobs. So I did a lot of case management um, at Title I schools, worked with homeless children, loved my jobs, but they just didn't pay a lot. So there were times when we had our lights turned off and um, unfortunately we had to apply for food stamps. I was so embarrassed, but my daughter, she's so precious. Uh, she said, when we went to apply, she said, mommy, what is this place? And I said, well, this is a place you come if you don't have enough food and they help you out. And she thought about it and she said, that is so nice of them. <laughs> so, you know, working full time and still qualifying for food stamps is really embarrassed, but it taught me empathy and that you never know where your journey is going to end up. And thank God it was temporary, but it was, it was really embarrassing. It was for us, for me, it was very embarrassing and we needed a lot of family support. So we relocated to the Washington DC area. We left Charlotte, North Carolina, moved back to where I was raised and my family helped us out tremendously. And um, eventually we ended up at what was formerly known as TC Williams High School. Now it's known as Alexandria City High School. And our community wrapped their arms around us and supported us. And I mean, it's such a team effort. And so that's, we have a nonprofit now supporting other youth through health and wellness. And that's the reason why, because we want to go help other people um, to get to be the best them that they can possibly be, whether it's an athlete or a biochemist, whatever it is to be your best self, we, we want to help you get there. I think Noah did a lot of good by sharing his story because there are a lot of young people who are at home or parents who feel like they don't see a light at the end of the tunnel. And he is living proof that not only is there a light at the end of the tunnel, I mean, this kid is on the Olympic stage. What does it feel like for you to see him being open about the challenges, open about mental health and the importance of all of these things? I want people to look at us and say, if they can do it, I can definitely do it because there's nothing special about us, but we just try to pull on all the resources we could get as far as, as family and friends and just our church community, like, we could never be here by ourselves. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. More Americans watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. Brady now has a wife of his own. You're almost in the next season of his. Talk to me about, about where he is in his life and what he's doing. Brady's doing really well. He, um, he and his wife, Toya, who is also a professional archer. She's from Slovenia. Um, they have uh, a baby. Ty was born in November. So I have my first grandchild. Best thing ever. When he met Toya and they got married, um, he, he's happy. So when you're happy with your life and, you know, you have to take care of your life first. And if you are happy with where you are in life, then everything else is going to fall into place. You no, know, he's an incredible uh, athlete, but he also has been a very vocal supporter of you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, talking about being a young African-American boy. You know, he's, he's, he's spoken out about that. How was that for you, that season? And it's not over. No, it wasn't over. It was a very very difficult season for us because um, 
He's very sensitive, Noah is. So seeing a lot of the police brutality that he was seeing was very painful. And he would say, mom, you know, what can I do to make a difference? So we had a lot of conversations about getting your message out there in the appropriate way, because you can say something that people agree with, but that if you, but you can also turn them away by your method of communication. So we were really careful to make sure that we communicated effectively because our goal is to unite and not to divide. What do you want people to know about Katie? She's on her own path. Everyone wants to say, well, Katie Ledecky was 15 and Katie Grimes is 15 and, and it's the same race, it's the same story. And I, I have to agree with Keisha on that. That puts a lot of pressure on a 15 year old. I want people to see Katie for Katie Grimes and she's got her own path and not to put such huge expectations on a 15 year old. Let her do her own journey with this. And um, I think that's important for her. And as her village of supporters, it's important for us to remember that as well, that this is, is Katie Grimes's journey. And we love Katie Ledecky's um, sportsmanship her. She has been such a great role model to Katie. She is a class act through and through. Julie, what do you want people to know about Brady? Brady, he is more than this elite athlete. Um, he is more than an Olympian. I think, you know, when I look at Brady, I see what a great human he is, what a great dad he is. Um, and husband and son, he's a humble, good natured human. And we're just so proud of him. That's what people need to remember is, is there more than what you see on TV that I'm most proud of is, is the man that he has grown into. Keisha, what do you want people to know um, about your son, about Noah? Track is what Noah does. It's not who he is. He loves his family. He's a homebody. He prefers to be at home than to be out somewhere else. He loves to play board games with his friends on Wednesday nights and just dancing and having a great time. And he has such a teachable spirit. And in teaching him, one of the things that I just told him about the pressure for the Olympics is when we get caught up in the media, it's almost like we're allowing other people to write our story, but we don't allow other people to write our story. We make our narrative and we are, you know, people first and track is just what you do. It's not who you are. Oh, I wish I could give you guys a group hug. I just wanted to say to both of you moms, um, I hope this isn't the end of your journey. I hope that they, you know, like Brady has been doing this forever. If your kids decide that they're going to go for the next one, you know, um, I, I hope that they continue if that's what they want to do and that you continue to enjoy this ride. It's, it's so much fun. Um, and so maybe we'll see each other in Paris. Cheers. I think that is awesome. And I'm just going to try to follow you guys on social media because I know for me personally, this journey gets very lonely. Um, yes. Times are hard. You don't have anybody to reach out to because if you reach out to people, they're like, what are you complaining about? You have an Olympian, you have two professional athletes, but people don't get that that's not what's important. It's their soul and guiding their heart. So I'm going to try to use you guys as some of my resources because it can get really hard. Oh my gosh, you guys are going to make me tear up and I don't have an Olympian. <laughs> no, but you've got an awesome kid. I do. No, I've got three little ones. And I, I, and I seriously, I'm getting teary because, you know, like at the end of the day, while we're busy talking about these Olympians, I just want you guys to know, sitting as a mom on that set, I'm thinking of you guys. And I just want you to know on behalf of all the people who will be watching this story that we see you too. Um, from sleeping in your van because you're at practice to cooking all sorts of meals and gallons of milk and <laughs> all of it. I just want you to know that, you know, your work obviously wasn't in vain and we know you love your children. And so we just wanted to give you a little bit of love too as we all look at Tokyo. Thank you. I will be praying for you too, Shanae. Yay! Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
Welcome to Today Food on Today All Day. So when life hands you lemons, you know what they say? Make limoncello. Today on an all-new Saucy, Anthony Contrino showing us how to make the boozy Italian spirit plus two lemony sweet treats that will want to make you pucker up. Everyone loves a sweet treat every now and then, and I have three that are stunning, delicious, and use one of my favorite ingredients in the entire world, Sorrento lemons. First up, a traditional Italian liqueur, limoncello. Then, my lemon curd tartlets. Finally, my favorite, a lemon and olive oil bundt cake with limoncello glaze. So grab a lemon and pucker up. It's not every day that produce from Italy comes in, but when my local Italian market gets the first batch of Sorrento lemons, I am like a kid on Christmas morning. Aside from the obvious difference in size, this lemon has a more bumpy skin, which contains more oils. So if you're using its zest or steeping it for something like limoncello, you're gonna get that much more flavor. Let's start making our limoncello. The first thing we need to do is peel these beautiful lemons. Grab your favorite peeler and just start peeling strips of the skin. Take your time. We don't wanna leave any of the skin behind. We don't wanna waste any of that flavorful skin. I wish you can smell how fragrant this is. It's amazing. Has a more sweet aroma than your traditional store-bought lemon. I'm making a huge batch of limoncello, so we're gonna need eight of these lemons. If you're using regular organic lemons, you're going to need at least 12 of them. My hands are gonna smell so good by the time I'm done with this. My carpal tunnel, however, not so much. Last one. Awesome. Look how beautiful all these peels are. The next step is to peel off any excess pith. So I'm gonna go through all of these and make sure that there's nothing that has more pith than what I'm seeing on this lemon. Now for the fun part. Grab yourself a fairly large glass jar, at least 56 ounces if possible, and simply add your hard work right into the jar. All of these gorgeous Sorrento lemon peels. And now for another very important ingredient, high proof grain alcohol. This stuff is strong, it is extremely flammable. It's 190 proof. You cannot drink this as is. It will literally burn your insides. But it's that power that is going to help pull all the flavor, all of the oils out of these lemon peels. Madonna. Whew. Do not drink it. <laughs> and I'm gonna add the whole one liter bottle right to our jar. Perfect. Now all that's left to do is wait. For me, it's more of a visual cue. I want the lemon peels to be pale, which means that all of the flavor, all of these oils have been sucked out of the peels. So around one to two weeks is probably best. Thankfully, I have a little trick up my sleeve. If you've been watching, you'd notice that we had this hiding in the corner the last few weeks, steeping just for today. And you can see the obvious difference. This is a deep golden yellow color. Isn't it beautiful?
we have everything we need. I made some simple syrup earlier that we're going to add to our strained limoncello. Oh, did you hear that pop? It smells a little bit like cleaning supplies right now. Don't worry about that. We'll take care of it. Get yourself an even bigger glass jar. Just going to place a strainer on top of our new jar and carefully to hopefully not lose any of this liquid gold, pour it. Eh. I didn't think this part through, did I? All right, we're just gonna go for it. Oh my God, how cool is that? That was easier than I thought it was gonna be. Now we're gonna pour our simple syrup right in. Look at how the color changes. It's this beautiful, sunshiny yellow color. At this point, it's almost done, but it's still way too strong to drink. So we have one last ingredient to add some cold water. This recipe makes a lot, so I hope you have a lot of friends. Just give it a little bit of a stir. Then it's just time to start bottling. Funnel will make this process a lot easier. Perfect. Just seal them up as you finish bottling them. Is that beautiful? I'd be very happy if someone brought me one of these bottles of limoncello. You can find these glass bottles at some craft stores, but I normally find them at a store that sells containers. A little bit left, which I'll jar later, but this, that's for me. Gorgeous. I'm going to let these cure in the freezer for a week. The good news is they could live in there for a year, just in time for the next Sorrento lemon season. Well, hello. Are you ready to whip up Anthony's delectable dish? Just text FOOD to 34318 and we will send that recipe right to your phone. More Americans watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines, so crucial for reopening America. A big day around here, a very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. <laughs> Celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope, the COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. interning in southern France, I learned how to make the best lemon curd I've ever had in my life. And thankfully, Chef Laurent was kind enough to share the recipe with me, and this is my version of it. The first thing we need to do is prepare our butter. This is one of those times when we want very cold butter. 
We don't want it room temperature. And I'm just gonna cut it into cubes. About a half inch cube would be perfect. Using two sticks, a full half pound of butter for this recipe. Definitely one of the reasons why this is so delicious. Set that aside. Let's start our curd. Now, I'm not one for really weird quantities in baking or cooking in general, but this recipe is so perfect that it does call for a weird amount of lemon juice. Exactly a half cup plus four teaspoons. It has to be that quantity, trust me. Don't round up, don't round down. Some sugar, three quarters of a cup, half a teaspoon of salt, and then some eggs. Three whole eggs and one yolk. This extra yolk is going to add a bit more decadence and richness. Okay, I'm gonna put this over medium heat. We don't wanna put it on top of an aggressive heat because we don't want scrambled eggs. Grab a whisk, start combining all of these ingredients. You wanna keep whisking over the medium heat until it starts to steam and you'll feel this mixture getting thick. Started to see my first wisps of steam. And it's done, just like that. Immediately off the heat, grab a spatula and through a fine mesh strainer into a food processor. Scrape it all down. Get every last bit of this curd in there. And then kind of in a back and forth stirry motion, start pushing your curd through the strainer. Put on your lid the right way. Turn your machine on. And then we're gonna start adding our butter a cube at a time. And it looks great to me. I'm gonna transfer this to a bowl. Look how silky, how smooth, and how beautiful it is. And it is delicious too, I promise. I can guarantee you that this Lemon curd is life-changing. Into the fridge for four hours or overnight until it's nice and thick. Thankfully, I have one all ready to go. Here I have some phyllo dough shells that you can find in the frozen section of your grocery store. We're gonna fill them with this delicious curd. Let me show you how to set up a piping bag. Fold down the top, then you wanna choose a tip I'm going with a medium small round tip. Cut a hole for your tip and slide it in. Right side up, prefer preferably. Then just push it forward and then pull to stretch out the plastic just a little bit. That'll lock it in place. And then simply just add this beautiful curd right into your bag. That'll be plenty for these tartlets. I'm gonna fill these with a slightly heaping mound of the curd, just like that. This smooth curd against this crispy phyllo shell is the perfect combination of textures. I'm gonna finish these off with a couple of things. First, a fresh raspberry for a little bit of color and just 
a sweet little pop of extra flavor. These are looking amazing already, but I have one more special touch to add to them. A little powdered sugar. It's pretty and adds just a kiss of extra sweetness. Just give it little gentle taps. A little bit of early morning snow. Aren't these just so adorable? They're delicious too, and I know my neighbors are gonna love them. So I'm gonna be a good boy, and I'm not going to touch them. No one said anything about the leftover curd though. More Americans watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. been a long year yeah where it's been anything but normal well now there's hope the covid vaccines i know i know it's been a little confusing like really confusing so it's more important than ever to make a plan visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine what are you waiting for roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine plan your vaccine plan your vaccine Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring is sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. Uh, celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it. More Americans watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. Let's go. And good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. This is one of the moistest cakes you will ever have. Honestly, I would have a slice of the simple and elegant bun cake over a layer cake any day of the week. You always wanna start with your dry ingredients. Two and a half cups of flour, right into your bowl, okay? Then we need some salt. You always need salt when baking. It helps bring out all the flavors of everything else that is in your batter. One teaspoon of that. I'm using two different leaveners, baking powder and baking soda. So just a half a teaspoon of the baking soda, and then one and a half teaspoons of our baking powder. Okay. I'm whisking this really well to evenly distribute all of the leaveners. Perfect, set this aside, and let's get started on our wet ingredients. First up, a stick of European or European-style butter right into the bowl of a stand mixer. Then some sugar. One and three quarters cup of sugar. Just add that right on in. May sound like a lot, but this is not an overly sweet cake. The olive oil component of our cake, make sure you're using a floral olive oil this is definitely not the time for a peppery olive oil. This is dessert. Quarter cup of this liquid gold. Smells so good. Just gonna go right on in, get all of those last little drips. And some lemon zest. I'm using a Sorrento lemon here, so 
half of the zest of this lemon will be more than enough. Paddle attachment. And we wanna beat this until it's super pale and nice and fluffy. You can see it lightening in color already. We can start adding our eggs. Three large eggs. Scrape it down again. Make sure there are no bits of egg that were missed. At this point, we're also gonna add a little bit of vanilla. I feel like every baked good needs just a little bit of vanilla. One teaspoon. We have our dry ready. We just need to finish our wet. I have a quarter cup of that delicious lemon juice from our Sorrento lemons. And to that, I'm going to add three quarters of a cup of buttermilk. Just give it a little bit of a swirl to incorporate. And now, let's finish it up. Start by adding half of your dry, and slowly on low so it doesn't fly out at you. Let it go, and as soon as it's almost fully incorporated, start drizzling in your buttermilk mixture. All that's left is our remaining dry ingredients. Once again, incorporate on low speed, and you wanna stop the machine as soon as it looks like it's almost all incorporated. Right there. I'll finish the rest by hand. You never want to overmix a cake batter. It'll get really tough. I want to lick this, but I'm not. Just going to make sure that any bits of flour are fully incorporated at this point. This looks great. Let's get into our pan. It's a nice, thick, luxurious batter. You can see some of those specks of the lemon zest in here. It's gonna be so delicious. Just gently start smoothing it. If you made a mess like I did, just carefully clean it up without ruining too much of your greased pan. One last thing that I like to do before I put it in the oven, a few taps on the countertop just to knock out any large air bubbles that may be in there. You wanna bake this for 45 minutes at 350 degrees until a cake tester comes out clean when inserted in the center. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. Uh, celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. Uh, celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it.
Americans watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. More Americans watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. Is this cake not stunning? You want to allow your cake to cool completely till it's cold to the touch, basically, at least room temperature, or your glaze will not set. So let's get started on it. One and a half cups of confectioner's sugar. I'm putting it right into a fine mesh strainer because we want to sift out any lumps. We want a nice, smooth glaze. Then using a spoon or spatula, whatever you have, just start working it through the strainer. There you go. To this, we're gonna add just a few more ingredients. Some melted butter, four tablespoons, and then two tablespoons each of whole milk, and of course, our limoncello. Keep the milk on standby, just in case you need to thin out your glaze. Just whisk, slowly pulling in all the sugar from the sides of the bowl. Oh no. I'm a mess. This glaze should be fairly thick, but still runny enough to drizzle down the side of our bundt cake. Okay, you want to use this quickly. Grab a spoon. Then work your way around your cake, allowing it to drizzle down the sides into the center and across the top. There you have it, our beautiful lemon olive oil bundt cake with limoncello glaze. All of these lemony treats make a perfect gift, and I'm gonna show you some fun ways that I like to package them when giving them to friends and neighbors. Let's start with our bundt cake. I'm going to carefully transfer it, looking for some naked cake space, right into the center, of our charger. Don't forget about our gorgeous lemon curd tartlets. These could be a little tricky to transport, but I discovered a trick. I bought this cute little shallow tin at a craft store, and I'm gonna put in just a small layering of sprinkles. That's gonna help keep them in place. And of course, they match our little tartlets. Just kind of nestle them in. Don't overcrowd, but look how cute this looks. A lot of people are gonna be begging me for this limoncello. Have a solution for that too. Have this cute lemon rubber stamp and some yellow ink. Just give it a little pat. And then with just any fine tip marker, Grab some twine, string it through your little tag, and we'll tie it to the sides of our bottle. Aren't these so cute? And there you have it, three delicious and adorable gifts that I know my friends and family are just going to love. They also happen to make an excellent bribe. Thank you.
I feel like as soon as I walk in the door, they can kind of detect my mood coming back from practice. Whether it's good or bad, they're always here to cheer me up and put a smile on my face. And Lila's more of like my emotional support pet. She's just here to be happy and have a good little life. I and Rambo's more of like, I'll make you laugh. I'm going to do something crazy today. I can never get mad at them. They just crack me up. They're, they're just the best dogs and they make me so happy. And they're my fur babies. I'm Sma Biles and this is my pet tail. This is Lila Biles and she is three years old. And then this is Rambo Biles and he is one years old. These are my babies. Rambo, when he came to us, his name was originally Rambo. And so I just thought that was cute and I kept his name. And then Lilo, I could not figure out a name for the life of me. And I just thought later down the road, if I got another Frenchie, it would be Lilo and Stitch because I think they look like Stitch. And so that's how her name came about. And then I just kept Rambo's. So we don't have Lilo and Stitch, but we do have Lilo and Rambo. So Lilo, I actually flew to Florida to pick her up when she was a puppy. And that was our first meeting. She was so itty bitty and I had to find like a pet friendly hotel. And she did an um, amazing job. Same as the flight, she did great. And she's more of the chill, calm, laid back dog. Rambo's the more rambunctious, let me see what I can get into, what I can find around the house. Um, let me test the other dog's buttons. But he actually came from Ohio and he was on like a pet transport bus. So he stopped in several states on the way to drop off other people's new puppies. And so he um, arrived right at my front door here in Spring, Texas. I love how Frenchies have such big personalities and each of them have different personalities. Rambo is the more hyper playful dog and Lilo is my little grumpy, I do what I want when I want princess girl. Oh my goodness, well I grew up with dogs. So as soon as I got them, as soon as I got Lilo and as soon as I got Rambo, I just knew they fit right in and it was the perfect home for them. I think since every weekend we have Sunday dinner with my family, I would always take Lilo and she met the German Shepherds and that's when I knew she fit in seamlessly with the other family dogs. Um, and then Rambo, he's just a little copycat. He is Lilo's shadow. So whatever Lilo does, he does and that's how I knew he fit in perfectly. He keeps us on our toes. Rambo loves to play with my boyfriend's dog, Zeus, which he's an English bulldog. They love to play around the house. Lilo's more of a, I'm gonna watch and see what you guys do and I'll sit on the couch while you guys are on the floor playing and she's just a chill dog, but it was a very seamless relationship. They got along well together and then we have three dogs. So we have a house full of bulldogs, which is so crazy. I never thought I would have three dogs so young, but it is what it is and they make our lives. Uh, well, they love going outside and playing in the backyard. We also have a pool, so they love exploring the ledge. And so they cool off whenever they want. We like taking them on walks, but we like playing catch with them or who can keep the ball away the longest, but they're just so smart. Um, what else? They love treats. They love, we have a dog wash station here in the house. They love getting baths. Well, Lilo and Zeusty Rambo is more of, I'm gonna jump off this thing. But yeah, and then going to the pet store. They like doing that and picking out their own treats or toys. Sometimes I'll take them to the gym um, so they can kind of see where I train. And there was like this one picture of Lila watching me vault and it was just the cutest thing. But I do try to alternate and take them to the gym. So they're in that atmosphere and the kids love them. Whenever they get out of their classes, they always make sure to stop by Lilo or Rambo and pet them. Um, so they've been on this journey with me. I think just being in that competitive mindset again, being out there performing, doing what I love and I train to do, I think that's what I'm most looking forward to. So Rambo has a crazy pike stretch that he does every day. Whenever he sits down, he just sits in a pike stretch. And I just wish my hamstrings were as flexible as his because I know I'm getting shy we're talking about you. And it's just the cutest, funniest thing, but I swear his hamstrings are more flexible than mine. I wish we could trade for a day because I might need him. I didn't teach him, it's just how he sits. Lilo does not sit like that. She's a little bit, so I'm a little thicker, but she doesn't sit like that. I 
know some other Frenchies feel like that, but I just never seen it. And I thought he would grow out of it because he did it when he was a puppy and he just turned one and he still does it. I'm like, okay. So I think it's just a forever thing, but it's so cute. If either of these guys could talk, this is what they would say. Lilo would definitely be sassy, like, no, mom, I'm not doing that. I do what I want when I want. And I'm more of just like, okay, this is your house. I'm living in it. And Rambo would probably be asking all the questions like, why can't I grab that? Why can't I eat that? Why can't I do that? He would be the more like questionable, like, why can't I just do this, mom? Right? Or can I go outside? Can I do this? It's more of the explorer. My dogs have made my life better significantly. They have made me happy when I'm at my low. And even whenever I'm at my highs, they've made it higher. They've just been the greatest asset that I could have got. And I don't regret it one bit. The amount of work that it takes to have two of these little pups, I wouldn't trade them for the world. Oh, they're like going to sleep now. They're like, okay, we're out now. Enough camera time for me, I'm shy. Good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. Uh, celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! I have two dogs. One's named Bella, she's a German Shepherd, and then I have a German Shepherd Husky mix. I got my younger one after Worlds. She was a bribe or a bet from my mom that, you know, if I made the Worlds team, I can get a dog, and so that's what I got. <laughs> I was like, Mom, can, if I make it to Worlds, can I get a dog? And this was in January, and I wasn't even on, like, the national team. I hadn't made an international assignment, so it was kind of like a, yeah, that's fine because it wasn't really in reach or it didn't seem. And so then when I made it, I was like, hey, I get a dog now. <laughs> I think it's always, you know, fun to come back home and have them like so excited to see you. I mean, your family's always super excited too, but it's really, you know, cool to see how excited they are when you come back home. They just want, you know, to, you to pet them and give them all the attention. I think it's really cool. I have two dogs. One is a... Uh... Yorkshire Poodle Mix, and she's just like really fluffy and a big ball of energy, um, and her name's Dolly. And then I have um, a Boston Terrier, and her name's Guinness, and she's like, she's pretty old, so she's just kinda chill and doesn't really do much. <laughs> Whenever I get home, they're always so happy, um, so just like, if you had a bad day, it makes like a bad day better, just coming home and them just wanting to play and being all happy. I have Marshall, who is a Bull Terrier mix, and I have Lily, who is a Yellow Lab, and it's, if you don't put it together, it's Marshall and Lily from the How I Met Your Mother show. Well, my girlfriend and I, we, we when we first started dating, How I Met Your Mother was like our show, and Marshall and Lily were like the role model couple, and so as we got our dogs, we just wanted them to have, you know, the perfect Marshall and Lily relationship. And 
Henceforth, Marshall and Lily became their names. I wouldn't say that Marshall and Lily are the best, you know, they're not, they're not the Marshall and Lily in the TV show, but I will say that their love is very deep-seated and it comes out in a lot of times, but there are times when Marshall's a little bit of a grump butt and he will, you know, because he really likes Mia and I, and he was raised without Lily in the house, and so there are times where he is getting snuggles from Mia or I. Lily will hop up and he'll just be like, like, don't get in the way of my snuggles right now. But beyond that, I would say, I mean, Marshall and Lily, if one of them were to leave each other, they would be absolutely devastated, and they do have this deep-seated connection of just I don't know, playfulness, and it's really nice to see because we're not always home all the time, and to have each, for them to have each other just means a lot for us to watch them still enjoy each other. They're there for me every single day. Any day that I can come home, have them just jump on me and give me kisses on the face, I'm now a much happier person in that moment. There's no guarantee about it. And there's times, you know, when things are going rough in the gym and my body hurts and I just need to be a vegetable for a little while and they'll just come support and always just pick me up. My pets have given me a lot to look forward to, but I think the most rewarding part about having pets is the fact that you get to care for someone else other than yourself and build them up and turn them into something that you actually want to love and be around all the time. And, they give you back so much more than you give them, and something about having that type of relationship that's constantly building is what brings meaning to having, you know, someone to take care of. So I got Stu in March. I was actually overseas still. He is a Aussie Doodle mix. He has like one blue eye and one half blue and brown eye, and like a Merrill coat. He makes my life better because even though I wasn't expecting to be hurt, he was there for me throughout my whole rehab process. And you know, it's, it always puts a smile on your face when you have like a dog who wants to play. He doesn't know anything else. He was afraid of my cast in the beginning, but uh, we got over that. My dog is Rooney. We call her Roo for short. She's a bull mastiff mi mixed with German Shepherd and Rottweiler. We rescued her from Craigslist and I love her so much. My favorite part of the day is taking her out on walks and it really calms me down after a stressful day. We can go out, we can play fetch and for whatever reason, it's really therapeutic and she's always so happy to see me and it, make, it just brightens my mood as well. So she's just the best. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. Good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. in the world.
I remember I wanted a dog my whole life. My dad never got me one. But coming up to the last months before 2016 Olympics, I was really sad without a dog. And I would just sit there looking out the window like, oh, I wish my dog was here even though I don't have one. And I was looking out the window thinking about a chocolate lab. And I was like, Mango is the perfect name for a chocolate lab. And I was like, what am I talking about? Mango's the perfect name for any dog that I get. So I went and I got a German Shepherd and I was like, you're Mango. His personality is exactly like mine. He is very hyper and energetic and I'm attached to him, he's very attached to me. You can tell when we're in the same room, he's my dog. <laughs> Mango does everything with me. He goes with me to the bathroom. He goes with me to the sink, to the refrigerator. He loves coming to practice with me, though that's probably his favorite thing. He comes to practice with me every day and plays in the backyard and just watches me lift weights. He would win the 100 meters. My dog is faster than yours. A hundred percent, I promise. <laughs> And I'm talking to everybody. <laughs> Mango has made my life better in every aspect. He is my, my little baby, my little best friend. He makes me happy when I'm sad and I just need him in my life. My dog is Arthur. He is a mutt. He's a dachshund, Jack Russell, Chihuahua, something. Um, he's 15 pounds, black and white spots. Very, very good at snuggling. Arthur is either feisty or super chill, he doesn't really have a lot of in-between, so he's either like barking at the front door, which drives me crazy, or snuggling on the couch, and um, or snuggling when I nap. And that's my favorite version of him, is the snuggly side. I purposely adopted a small dog because I know how tired I am after practice, and I wanted a dog that literally I could walk to the coffee shop a half mile away and walk back and he'd be pooped. We go on little walks to get coffee and that's really nice. His best friend is a Rhodesian Ridgeback that's 120 pounds and so if him and his best friend are together, we can go to the dog park, but he doesn't like to do that unless his bodyguard best friend dog is there. So he's kind of just a chill couch dog with me primarily. I got hurt. Um, I had a stress fracture that kept me out of competing at the World Championships in 2013 and that's when I adopted Arthur because I needed happiness in my life and I needed some joy in my days. And so I adopted him then when I was going through that injury and he definitely brought me joy and happiness and made me not stress and be too much in the weeds about my injury. So that was the start of uh, my relationship with Arthur and it was very important for me. Arthur is not athletic. Sweetie, he's so sweet. I love him so much, but he's not an athlete. So I'm not gonna insult any Olympic sport by claiming Arthur would be good at it because he's not athletic. This is Winnie, Winnie the Miniature Dachshund. Winnie the Mini Winnie is her nickname, and she's really helped make mine and my wife's life better just to be able to have somebody goofy running around the house at all time that isn't 6'7 is nice. Um, <laughs> she, um, is, this is about as big as she's gonna get to, and it's nice to be able to have a best friend um, for my wife and I that can do all the traveling with us and they can really just um, bring some joy to our lives. And you know, there's just something so simple about ha <laughs> having somebody around that only wants to love on you and uh, eat food. <laughs> so Milo is my mutt of a dog. We're not exactly sure what he is, but he's very cute. And uh, we got him when he was just six weeks old and my girlfriend was just, she initiated the conversation by saying, I think I want a dog. And then about four hours later, she owned a dog. Um, so it was very just run of the mill. And then, you know, that, that same night, went to Petsco and got him a, a bed and some toys and things. And he's really spoiled. And, you know, he gets to travel with us a lot. And he's just, he's a good dude. Let's go. And good evening from New Orleans, there is breaking news.
good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. NBC News than any other news organization in the world. More Americans watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. I have a dog. His name is Ripley. He's a Blue Merle Australian Shepherd. He is the light of my life and, you know, keeps a smile on my face every single day, no matter what happens. I think I have my dog as something to just always make me feel positive and happy. He really is my best friend and he is my little training buddy and partner in crime and comes with me whenever I go do my workouts. Um, and you know, he's, he's my dog. He's my relentless supporter and I love him. <laughs> I have a little fur baby by the name of Mila, and because she's so pretty like Mila Kunis, and um, she is, we rescued her as a puppy. She was like about 10 weeks old, they thought, and she's a lab pit mix, I think. We're not really sure, but that's my guess, and she is the most human creature I have ever met. Everyone that comes over says she's so full of expression and if any dog just is gonna talk one day, it's gonna be her because we literally talk to her all day, every day, and she runs the show at the house. A few weeks after getting Mila, um, I actually broke my leg and uh, that was a few months after my mom had also passed away. And so I ended up spending a lot of time um, at home with Milo, training her and doing rehab and therapy when she was a puppy. And I think that that was really special uh, for me to get that time with her as a puppy and trying to get up and down the stairs on crutches with an unpotty trained dog was difficult. <laughs> but it was a... Uh, it was a special time for me, and then she's also been there now throughout my husband's injury. She hasn't missed a therapy session of his in years, so she goes there every morning and waits, waits for him to come there, so I think that she's just a little bundle of joy. Ollie is my rescue dog. My mom and dad are incredible. They took him for three months over the winter because we were training in California and living in like a dorm situation and he couldn't be there. Everyone's helped raise Ollie and having Ollie in my life is so amazing. Obviously because my husband is gone and um, it helps to just have a little companion there. But it's also been really nice to have someone, a dog to be responsible for um, outside of rowing and it helps me to manage some of my stress to just kind of put my focus and my energy into him and make sure that he's getting what he needs and his face is also very cute and relaxing so that helps too. Uh, one, he was supposed to be 100% lab but I think he's half lab half Weimariner. He's very skittish and kind of anxiety that's the one that eats the ornaments <laughs> and he's like or he's supposed to be a charcoal lab but I think he's a little bit wine runner, or a lot. And then I uh, have one English red fox lab also, that's three. And he's just like, man's man, sits around, does nothing, easy going, uh, likes sunbathing in the backyard and hanging in the garage while I'm stickering boards. <laughs> I'm Floyd's dad, it's kind of a weird term, but yeah, that's my dog. <laughs> Floyd's been incredible for me for recovery and uh, just kind of unwinding from a long day of practice and stress. It's just, it's really easy to go home when you open the door and your dog runs at you and it's a bulldog who can't really run. It's more of a waddle and, and pretty much half out of breath by the time he gets to you. It's pretty cute, but um, he's definitely an interesting being. And he's not really a dog, he's more of a creature. He doesn't, has no normal dog tendencies. Oh my gosh, I love my animals so much and um, they haven't been able to be physically there, but I have so many pictures. My phone is literally all my pictures of my animals. You know, it's crazy because it's the sweetest thing when I travel and then come home, they they know me, they like, it's so crazy. And it's just, they're 
Oh my gosh, just my mom too on FaceTime whenever I do time, <laughs> FaceTime my mom. I think that's probably one of the most important things during the games is that you can get so wrapped up in focusing and getting anxious and excited and nervous at the same time. But then when I'm on FaceTime, all the nerves just go away and I'm just like, oh my, I'm that person screaming into my phone and like squealing like a little kid. And um, oh my God, I just love them. Um, my first friendship was, and like, besides my mom was an animal. We got our buddy who's not there, but I love animals so much. And I don't know if it's because I, I'm, such, I'm that weirdo where I will cry if there's an animal being hurt in a movie, but I can watch a person, whatever. It's really sad. I probably shouldn't admit that, but I just, I don't know if it's because like they don't have a voice and I really want to like, I don't, prov not provide for them, but just like love them so much and they love us unconditionally, they love me unconditionally, even if you forget to feed them one day, they don't remember that. And I, oh my gosh, I mean, the world's just so amazing with animals and way better with animals. I was walking Reese and this girl was like, oh my God, that's Reese. Like, it's Reese. And I was like, what? And then they're like, wait, if that's Reese, that must mean that that's Chloe. I was like, you people know what my dog looks like and then you realize it's me like, She's like more famous than I am. Hi, it's Chloe Kim, and this is my pet tail. <laughs> she goes, this is my cute little Australian Shepherd, Reese. She is four years old, and she is my best friend. I have always wanted an Australian Shepherd. Like, since I was a kid, I've just always wanted one. So I went online and found her. She was actually all the way in Texas, and the day I was going to go pick her up, um, something came up, so my dad had to fly to Texas to go pick her up. So my dad's such a trooper, but he flew to Austin and um, met, picked her up there and then flew back with her like an hour later. And um, my dad just like came, walked out of the terminal like with this little chubby spotted dog and I just put her in her lap, in my lap, and um, it was just love at first sight. She like would follow me around everywhere. She was my first puppy. Like I've never had a puppy before, so I had no idea what I was doing. She was like had really bad separation anxiety in the beginning. So I remember like sleeping with her like downstairs in the living room on like a body pillow. So uncomfortable. But I did that for like three days, and then I was like, okay, maybe I should just let her, you know, do her thing at night. She actually kind of looked like a Reese's Pieces when I first met her because she had like these really like dark brown spots, these really white, white spots and like, like her little caramel spots. So I just thought she kind of looked like a Reese's Pieces. So it took me a few days and then I decided I wanted to name her Reese. Reese has the biggest personality. She is just so down for an adventure. Like the minute I stand up, she's like, okay, cool. Where are we going? Like, what are we doing? I'm like, chill, like I'm just gonna go to the bathroom or something. But she'll like always follow me around. She's just down for anything. She loves to play. She loves her ball. She loves spooky balls. She also loves the little like doggy puzzles where you like, where she like does the little puzzles to like find treats. And she's really smart and she's just a little cuddle bug. She's kind of standoffish sometimes. Like, she's like, okay, mom, like, stop petting me. Like, I don't want love. But the minute she wants love and attention, she'll just snuggle up to you and just like, flop on your lap, kind of like this. And then she'll just stay for hours. Reese quickly became like a very important member of the family. When I told my family I wanted a puppy, like an Australian Shepherd puppy, everyone was so against it. Like, because, you know, I understood because I travel a lot and, um, that would mean like they'd have to take care of her while I was gone. And then we got her and my sisters came over one day when she was still like a baby. We got her when she was like eight weeks old. So when she was still a baby, they came and they instantly fell in love with her. Cause she was like so small and just like, just this cute little bundle of joy and energy. And now they argue over who gets to watch her when I'm gone. It's like my parents want her, but then my sisters want my one sister wants her, but my other sister really wants her. So they're always just arguing about who gets to keep her. <laughs>
the certainty of growing things. The kind of faithfulness that whatever life does, whatever, and I think over the last year of the pandemic, this has been a very powerful, that however difficult things are, there is a, there is a surety that things will grow and they will flower and they will die. And that's fine. That's okay. That's part of the rhythm. Life endures. It happens. Yeah, yeah. Which is incredibly grounding at a moment when most of us feel like so much is out of control. It's connecting you with, with things that feel like they matter. You don't even have to explain why they matter because they just do. And they, and they also are real. You can't fake it. Monty Don has been Britain's most famous gardener for decades, hosting BBC Gardener's World for the last two from his home at Long Meadow near the Welsh border. Hello, welcome to Gardener's World. The show now available in America, seeing its highest viewership in 10 years. It's exactly the escape we all needed. That, that pace of life, which is changing all the time, but at its pace, not yours, not the pace of modern life. And the deep rhythm of it that connects the seasons is spiritually very rewarding, as well as fun, it's nice, it's good, you know, it's easy, it's not, it's not a complicated thing. For Monty, his career in gardening sprung from a deep depression after closing his jewelry business with his wife, Sarah. Working in a garden outside really has uh, results that very often pharmaceutical uh, efforts don't. And I think that everybody can improve their well-being, if you like, if not their mental illness. So you can improve your mental health by working in a garden. And my goodness, we all need that. Monty is joined every Friday night in prime time by his two popular co-stars. There's Nelly and Patty. Meanwhile, stuck at home, we had all become gardeners. So these are some of my seedlings. So I think these are kaolettes, maybe, or this is kale. Didn't label them, rookie mistake. That's supposed to be salad. This is supposed to be lettuce. With varying degrees of experience and success. Come on. Monty just pops these out. And while it's a global language, our connection with the great outdoors, Monty observes, is culturally pretty different. And what struck me was the relationship with nature and wilderness and with gardens. You have such impressive wilderness. Mm -hmm. You know, you have the amazing mountains and deserts and lakes and rivers. You know, they're all bigger and, and there's just more of them and the distance. So there's a disconnect with your back garden and that. If you want to immerse yourself in nature, you can do a journey and, and be in as wild a state I as anyone I go hiking, in the right. Yeah. I, get out, I leave my house. Yeah, you see, you talk about hiking. We go for a walk. <laughs> We take the dogs for a walk. We go, you know, I go out the gate and go out across some fields. You go hiking and you, you know. You, and we wear spandex. Yeah, we, yeah, 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 I know, yeah. the whole so, thing. And that sort of, in some ways, that's wonderful. In lots of ways, it's wonderful. But it sort of makes your back, your yards redundant. When you were in America, mm. biggest difference? Well, the, I suppose the, the obvious difference is the, the sort of archetypal suburban American front garden mm -hmm. with these lawns running seamlessly down to the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And the whole British idea of a garden is somewhere that is private and hedged in. And you don't go into it unless you're invited in. Whereas in America, hey, hi, hi, I'm here. <laughs> Look at me. I'm the same as you. It's very much, that's my MO kind of yeah. on, a, on a regular yeah. basis. Yeah. Whereas we say, hello, have we been introduced? <laughs> Do you think there's kind of there's going to be an American gardening renaissance? Yes. Kind of on, we're on yes. the cusp of that. Absolutely. And not just a renaissance, I think a genuine naissance, a birth. <laughs> I think that all the great things that we love about America, the mm -hmm. energy, the optimism, mm -hmm. this sense of making it happen because you want it to happen, um, can be applied to gardening. And optimism is central to his BBC show Big Dreams, Small Spaces, also available in the US, it's a makeover show with very British sensibilities. People have bonkers ideas. And my favorite two things that you do are when people say, you know, I really want to make this model thing and put this moss in here. Yeah. And you say, lovely. That, that sounds like a wonderful idea. And the other thing, when people fall in love with tropical plants that are entirely inappropriate for their setting, yeah. you tell them such. And three months later, they have planted that plant. Yeah. Yeah. And you go back and they've ignored everything you've yeah. said. 
That's absolutely right. It's, the, 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 I share all that. And I, I really, the, the thing about Big Dreams is obviously, what, is that it, it's based around ordinary people doing extraordinary things within the context of the, I mean, yes. the more wacky, the better. Right. But actually, some of the most moving ones for me have been when people have done something very modest, but it's been big for them. It's not a race. It's not a competition. And now a new generation is digging in. A club moss. I have a club moss here. Greetings. Take a look at this succulent. Last year on social media, updates and tutorials, even the dawn of the plant fluencer. As especially in the rain, they do go over quite quickly. And for Monty, that meant a younger, more diverse, more global fan base. I think what's changed because A, the whole idea of the ecosystem, of ecology, of climate change, are pressing and direct and immediate. And gardens are an expression of that, inevitably. And we care a lot about that as we a generation. Sure consistency, and so you should. You know, I mean, one of the, increasingly I see my role in life is to empower and enable your generation to do something about it, right. not just talk about it or avoid it. And secondly, I think that you've, you've sort of gone sideways at it. So, for example, who would have thought five years ago that houseplants would be probably the biggest oh. thing in gardening? Right. Nobody. Yes. And so, so what you've done is said, OK, we don't have a garden. Let's bring it indoors. There's the Internet. You now can, can talk to each other. You have access. Yeah. You can show pictures. You can do Instagram. We had none of that. A whole tranche of the population have a very different relationship with their garden because yeah. that is their outdoors. That is That's their it. relationship to nature. It's not seen as a job or a chore or a duty. It's seen as something that, the, that can give to them as well as them do to it. And I just think that that gets us back to the basic elements of humanity. It's who we are, it's what we do, and that is empowering. And luckily, we've got Monty, Nellie, and Patty too, on both sides of the Atlantic there to lead us. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I can track this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I can track this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. And food for thought, arriving in the U.S. as a refugee is certainly a difficult transition, and the pandemic has made that adjustment even more challenging. But one nonprofit called World Relief Seattle is offering some refugees a glimmer of home in a community garden, helping them grow right here in America. Take a look. Wow, thank you. Welcome to Paradise Parking Plots. Once a neglected parking lot on the outskirts of Seattle, this community garden is now host to 44 plots tended by refugee families from 23 different countries. This is a community garden for refugee and immigrant communities who wanted to grow food from their countries and they missed seeing that at their local grocery stores. Tamina Martelli is the program manager for World Relief Seattle, a refugee resettlement organization that built and maintains the garden. She's also no stranger to the struggles faced by the family she helps. I came to this country from Bangladesh. I was actually underage and I was living with this American family in a very rural part of Idaho and I was kind of like a Tootsie Roll in a marshmallow factory. I was one of the only dark people in this entire town. 
to live in a place that is very, very different often takes time and it takes patience and it takes kind of that resilience. I have worked in refugee resettlement related things, kind of creating that type of thing for the last 25 years. Prem Adhikari, a Bhutanese refugee, has found solace and sustenance here throughout the pandemic, growing vegetables from her homeland. So this one, we call in our language, it is chukruke, uh, but I never found in grocery store in America. We eat every time freezer before, but when I start my gardening, I eat the fresh vegetables. The pandemic did not stop the garden from hosting its Refugee Youth Summer Academy for ages K through 8. The kids learn about environmental science and work on their English skills. We're doing some online kind of virtual learning, but we're still doing a portion at the garden, which has been a highlight for the kids to be able to get out of their apartments and to come here. You can look at different types of vegetables, plants, flowers, and you can just learn a lot of things. For example, they we, we can learn about bees pollinating. So what happens when flowers become pollinated? It turns into fruits. That's right. High five. So smart. The summer program also employs interns from immigrant backgrounds. 17-year-old Risa Suho, a Filipino immigrant, says she was placed in special ed classes when she first came to the U.S. because she wasn't in lockstep with her classmates. When you're told that you're special ed, because you can't keep up with other kids. You don't think like, it's the education system failing me, it's the thought that I'm failing myself. It's super important, especially for these younger children, to see someone who kind of looks like them and can relate to their experience. Refugees are often incredibly resilient because of the so many different things that they have had to go through. Often I will have gardeners tell me, my plants don't know there's a pandemic. Having the power to grow your own food a virus can't take that away. And that's kind of what we're working towards is providing solutions that are sustainable over time. Nice. And this amazing program is not ending with the fall harvest. World Relief Seattle is piloting a new winter course for refugee gardeners, too. You can find more about the program on today.com. It's good. Good for the kids, too. Good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. <laughs> Celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it. Good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. We were not but a few steps into Central Park's ramble when. This guy right here. Yeah. And he's a what? White throated sparrow. Until that moment, I assumed all sparrows dressed alike. So these sparrows are part of kind of the first big wave of migrants that are going to be on their way through the area. And this is a good, good place to see them. We are with Cornell University ornithologist Andrew Farnsworth, a sort of Bill Nye of birds, if you will. 
Did it surprise you in the last year as COVID and the pandemic took over that people, it seemed like, went crazy for birds? It was not a surprise. This kind of uh, situation where people want to be a part of nature, and especially in a time when there's a lot of emotional challenge and a need to reconnect with something, anything, and the connection with birds because they are beautiful, they sing, they do cool things. Like that robin you shrewdly observe hanging around all winter. Turns out some are true frequent flyers. There are some that are residents here, but there are also birds that migrate to New York that spend the winter. There are birds that breed here that leave New York and disappear for the winter. So even though it looks like robin is always here all the time, there's tremendous flux in this species. Farnsworth has traveled the world, observing, studying birds. An avian ally, it seems sometimes the birds came to him. Oh, there it is. <laughs> That is just a great looking bird. I'm sorry, have we seen the warbler? I'm a little high from that. <laughs> Warblers are the epitome of spring migration. Bird watching can be mesmerizing. Great way to engage and also disconnect both. I like that phrase, engage and disconnect. Easy enough to see why so many recently flocked to this pastime, like Sheldon Goodrich. What does it do for you to come out and watch? Uh, it's, it's, it's peaceful. It's, it's, I mean, especially now in the spring, the sounds of the birds, um, sometimes just sitting and hearing the water, hearing the birds, watching the behavior, it's, it's, it's peaceful. But for birds, the world is not as welcoming as it once was. How are our friends, the birds, doing these days? That's a good question. It does vary by species, but if we think about bird populations as a whole, in the last 50 years, there have been precipitous declines. Birds are, in fact, the proverbial canary in the coal mine of the environment. The North American bird population is down by three billion since 1970. If we're thinking about birds as uh, indicators of our environment, what does three billion birds lost say about the challenges our ecosystems are facing around the planet? Nearby, a massive barred owl has been perched for months. I check her when I can, and most of the time she's there. Isn't that something? Oh, it's great. It's great. As if to remind us that birds are a cherishable, but also perishable, gift of nature, not to be taken for granted. And I've been listening to a chorus of birds this morning. Mm. House wren. <laughs> on cue. Could you hear it? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And for people who want to get into this, there are so many sites. Cornell, for instance, has this amazing ornithology department. They have a great eBird website. You can get into it. I've seen one for the state of Minnesota. There are all kinds of them. To, to help you take little tiny, tiny steps into this amazing, amazing avian world. It's, mm -hmm. it's just terrific. I feel more peaceful just after yeah. that story. I wonder yeah. if the birds are on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Al, do you know the difference between a bird watcher and a birder? Uh, no. Bird watcher, they say, is just somebody who just observes birds, mm -hmm. but a birder is somebody who will travel to go look at birds. Oh, mm. right. So I guess wow. you're well, they a keep lists. A lot of these folks keep lists and they want to make sure, oh, I haven't gotten the something something sapsucker yet. Right. So they, ah. you know, take off to go Seek find it. Yeah. Something something sapsucker. Sap right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Our local you. birder, Harry yeah. Smith. Yeah. Yeah. The last six That's months, I've seen watcher, so many bird watchers. Bird watcher. Oh, yeah. Do you feed the birds when you're out there? Do you bring some crumbs? Is that allowed? You know, I asked I asked Farnsworth about bird feeders, and he said it's okay. okay. And okay. there are a lot of places, actually, in Central Park, where people kind of spread crumbs oh, and yeah. stuff. Okay. But, okay. I don't know if that was allowed or not. Thank you, Harry. Okay. We spent a lot of time indoors lately, so why not get out and explore? Well, this morning's influence her is a nature lover who is sharing her passion. Rue Mapp is the creator of Outdoor Afro, a nonprofit that encourages black Americans to embrace the great outdoors. She's already inspired thousands to do it, including Miss Oprah Winfrey herself. If time and money were not an issue, what would you really be doing? And I opened my mouth and my life fell out. I said I'd probably start a website to help black Americans connect with nature. And it was like the world opened up. At 37 years old, Rue was raising three kids and finishing up a college degree when she started a blog called Outdoor Afro. 
What is Outdoor Afro? I grew up with such an incredible connection to nature and recognized how it had improved my life. But as I continued to get out into nature experiences away from cities, I didn't see enough people who looked like me. And I certainly didn't see us represented in the pages of the glossy magazines that highlight the outdoors. So I started that blog from my kitchen table in 2009. Today, more than a decade later, that blog has turned into a national nonprofit organization with networks in 30 states, with 40,000 people participating and growing. We do that through a leadership team of folks that we train to connect people to nature and to really kind of help people get their nature swagger back. Ooh, nature swagger. I like that. I have to tell you, I'm sitting here thinking about my childhood and growing up. As far as, let's say, going to national parks or some of those kinds of things, I don't remember us really doing that. We have to really uh, rethink nature, right? Like nature is not only in these hallowed national parks. It's right in your own neighborhood. Outdoor Afro brings people together for all types of activities. How to camp, how to fish, how to kayak, you know, those skills. But then there's also the community where you can go out and you can be surrounded by people who are learning right along with you. Yeah. When did it resonate with you? I think this is going somewhere. I could see the place that Outdoor Afro could step in and fill some of the gaps that I saw. We are diversity within the diversity. You know, a friend of mine, she's like, Rue, just, just step out and the net will appear. A net she has counted on since her 20s after climbing a mountain for the first time. It is a powerful metaphor and that, that's exactly what it became for me. At the moment where I was about to give up, my instructor leans over and he says, Rue, trust your feet. That's when I knew that nature was a healer and a teacher. In 2010, Rue was part of the think tank that inspired Michelle Obama's Let's Move campaign. All you kids grow up healthy. She continues to work with the California State Parks Commission and recently took Oprah hiking earlier this year. It was so perfect to get out there with Oprah and to talk about the history of Redwoods. Those trees tell a story of rebirth and regeneration that I feel all people can connect in and relate to. I've done several interviews now with experts and when I ask them how to find peace in the middle of what feels like a stormy situation in this country, uh, one of the top experts said, you know what? Look to nature, soak up the sun, you know, just breathe. I always say that you go out in nature and the trees don't know that you're black. The birds are gonna sing no matter how much money is in your bank account. The flowers are gonna bloom no matter what your gender is or whether or not you're a Republican or a Democrat. It is truly an equalizer. There's just so much going on in the country right now. How do you, with what you do, wrap your mind around all of this? And I ask myself, like, what is it that I need to be doing right now? How do I show up? Root showed up by organizing and leading healing hikes. It's about people getting out and really finding that healing for themselves. There's a whole range of emotion, trauma, discord that's happening. And we have to still be present for our families. We still have to take care of ourselves. And so I really want people to turn to nature to get the restoration and the healing that they need. So true. By the way, anyone is welcome to join Outdoor Afro on their adventures. More Americans watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. <laughs> Celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now, it's your turn. 
Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. And good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. On a frosty winter morning, Alice Lewick is suiting up. You feel warm enough? Yeah. You want an extra pair of gloves? Alice may be dressed for the sledding hill, but instead she's headed to Hickory Hill Nature School in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania. All right, can we hop this? Woohoo! It's what's called a forest kindergarten, where the children are outside all day, rain or shine, even during the recent snowstorms. Stacy Gummy started the school five years ago. There are days I have to imagine where it is freezing, sleet, rain, or on the other end of the spectrum, it can get really humid and hot. Do the kids complain? No. Children are, are very resilient. We all know that everybody says it all the time. Here we really realize they're resilient, but we have to start off warm and we have to have the right gear. Alice began last fall in virtual kindergarten. Her mom, Rebecca, has a health condition that made in-person classes too risky. Tell me what it was like there in the beginning trying to get her to sit in front of a computer she just wasn't getting the joy that I think she would have been getting in the classroom if we were able to do that. She just wants to be out in the world like like so many little kids. A friend tipped Rebecca off to Hickory Hill and in November, Alice was one of the few to get off a long waiting list filled with parents looking for a safer alternative to in-person school, one that didn't involve sitting in front of a computer. We had a wait list of over 40 children and we have 12 spots 12 per day. Spots. Have you ever had any cases of COVID or had to shut down? None. 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 Nope, it hasn't even touched us. Forest kindergartens are getting new attention during the pandemic, but they started in Denmark in the 1950s and are popular across Europe. Ready? Let's show her. Let's see. Look. And oh, you can wow. see they've gotten a lot bigger. They might be salamander. We're not positive. I have to ID it still. So this is not teacher led, this is child led. We ask them inquiry questions and based on that, they follow their interests. What did this bark come from? And there's so many studies now that show when a child follows their interests, they retain that information much more readily. Nature preschools and kindergartens in the U.S. triple in the past three years. The increase coming as children are spending half as much time outside as their parents did. Many kindergarten teachers are saying kindergarten is now first grade. What we learned in first grade is now learned in kindergarten. So that play is out the window mm. and it's tough. I think reading and writing and all that comes very naturally to children because it's fun to learn. However, we are working on life skills. These children are going to be resilient and able to go into a school and communicate with adults wonderfully, with, other, with their peers wonderfully, and learn to critical think. What are they doing? So they're driving their cars. Oh, they're driving cars, mm -hmm. of course. But I look at this as they are learning to communicate, work together. Yeah. A big component of four schools, risk taking. Go backwards. Oh, and pull all goodness. your weight. So this is this is a skill that we have to teach. And they're so fearless. Outdoor play that's building a valuable skill set. Climbing trees test their balance and motor skills. We are here to get to hear the sap running inside of it. They're learning to recognize patterns in the animal tracks around the school. Uh, a deer And learning to share in my favorite, the mud kitchen. Can I have some of those ingredients? Yeah. Those muddy clothes, they might be the only downside to the parents we spoke to at pickup. I saw you pull up and you've got a whole organized system. You take the muddy clothes, take those off. Yep. <laughs> you must be used to this by now. Yep, they come home completely drenched and covered in mud almost every single day. They love it. The smile after Alice's first day of school, making it all worth it. I texted Stacy a picture of her face the second she got in the car and I said, I have not seen this face since March. It makes me just feel such deep gratitude for the fact that she has it back and has had it since.
My name is Herman Hayes and I make Dillard's Delights Donuts. James Nancy was my oldest sister's son, music producer and my little knucklehead. My son told me he was going by the name Jay Dilla. I don't know how he created it or why or from. You could probably find out from Questlove or Pete Rock, somebody who probably asked him that question professionally. Dilla worked with so many artists. That there's too many for me to name and not leave somebody out. Erica Badu is common. Tribe Called Quest, De La Soul. Dilla's father was the leader of the Ivies, which was a local Motown group, along with my sisters being trained as an opera singer and gospel singer. We could tell at a young age that he was just inclined to love music. Wanting to hear music and wanting to play music was in the blood, you know what I mean? But he just took it to another level. Dilla's personality as a kid was a recluse. I was the one he was bugging, you know, because I had the donuts and I would bring the donuts. And, and with me, he would talk because he knew I was the bearer of the donuts, you know. I have always used drumsticks, even when Dilla was a baby, to turn my donuts. No idea that he would be a drum master. I think he had that sense that went through him that I can communicate and I can touch people through sounds. He was in LA living because of health problems. Common told him you can come stay with me in Cali and he went out and lived with Common. I know he had kidney failure. I know he had lupus. They misdiagnosed him a few times because different effects come from lupus. They lose the hair, they have the blotches on the face. It's predominantly a woman's disease. My oldest son had visited him in uh, California. He said, Jay ain't doing too well. A little saddening and I was hoping he'll, he'll come out of it. He'll be fine. He's young. I want people to know that lupus devastated my family. He made his album called Donuts, and like I say, I was shocked. I was grateful, uh, a little stunned by it. It's, it's kind of getting me now, because I'm, I'm flashing back to February 10th, 2006, you know, and I was like, wow, you know, just blew my mind, you know. We started to honor him by doing lupus walks and raising awareness and raising money through the Alliance for Lupus Research. Thirteen years ago, we started an event called Donuts Are Forever as a way to honor Jay Dilla as a producer that we really love. People started meeting me and saying, oh, you're the uncle who made the donuts. And this was like, it's just, you know, you started this. And I was like, well, no, I'm new to the hip hop scene because these are the kids who embraced him. These are the kids who eventually taught me who Dilla was. <laughs> This is the old school artisan way of making donuts. This is the way Dillard's Delights makes our donuts. We raise the dough in proof boxes. We hand cut every donut that comes through here. It's a tedious overnight process. The little sleep that I get, sometimes it's an hour and a half, sometimes it's two hours, sometimes it's none. Hey, good morning. Good morning. I don't want to be known as a quitter. I don't want to let Jay down. I don't want to let the family down. I don't know what day it is sometimes, but I know I live some days for him.
Village Delights is named Village Delights because me and my niece Sean felt that his two daughters, Paige and Jemiah, would be the delights of his life. And we did not want to open the donut shop without his legacy being honored. When certain people come up to me and they tell me like what he's done and how their music has like changed them, it's kind of like, like a wow moment, you know? He has touched so many people in his short time here. His legacy just continues to live on. The thing I love most about Uncle Herm is he's just very warm and open and he'll push you to go better. He seems like he wants the best for you. Work hard. Don't wait on something to be given to you. If you want it, go get it, you know? It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope, the COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope, the COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Excuse me, what size shoe you wear? Can I ask you, what size shoe you wear? Can I give you a pair of sneakers for free? Yeah? yeah. yeah? Here, Mr. Daniel, try these on for me, please. Everything that we do, especially as New Yorkers, starts with our feet. They good? There you go, man. That's for you. No, thank you, Mr. Daniel. Appreciate you. Good. Because it's a little pain because all the time with it. And I take it one time off a week, maybe, if I want to take a shot on. Wow. Yeah. There are 67,000 less fortunate or homeless people in the state of New York. Almost 2,000 to 3,000 of them are walking around with no shoes on. They're people just like us, and they should not be forgotten. It's From the Soul is a nonprofit organization providing sneakers to the less fortunate. We are a store for them. We do not call them homeless. We call them less fortunate because we believe in one day they will move into a place of becoming fortunate. Companies have now donated towards our organization. Regular people have donated to our organization. Everybody can look into their closet. Every single person can look in their closet and see something that you know you're not gonna wear anymore. Now the bridge between that is something you're not gonna wear anymore and finding who needs it. 2012 till today, we have given more than 30,000 sneakers. My main mission is to educate people that helping the less fortunate can be enjoyable. How you feel? You all right? Yeah, man. Yeah. You know what's nice is that some of these sneakers I remember growing up really went in. I came from Barbados when I was four years old and I've lived in Brooklyn, New York for 41 years now. I worked as a stylist, a client specialist in fashion for 20 years. I'm tired of seeing less fortunate people with no sneakers on, when this sneaker culture is a billion dollar industry. Every 12 to 13 blocks, there is a sneaker store. How can there be less fortunate people walking around with no comfort? We're asking for gently worn or brand new sneakers. We don't believe in giving anything that we would not put our feet into. I haven't provided in uh, about two, three weeks, 
So because I haven't provided in two, three weeks, they're gonna be there waiting for me today. There's 30 sneakers in these two bags, and we're gonna make sure that some less fortunate people are walking very comfortable today. My first time going, or first couple of times, I didn't know where to go. But as I continue to do it, I realized that there's four areas I go. 14th Street Union Square, Madison Square Garden Penn Station, Port Authority Bus Station, Grand Central Station. Those four areas, 24 seven, they will be there waiting for you. Can I give you a pair today? Yeah, I believe okay. you are crazy. All right. You already know I love you. All right, man. Everybody out here in the city love Andre. I'm feeling good, man. Everybody gonna want to see you. There right. you go. And I want to see everybody too, man. I know, I know you do. All right, family, enjoy your day, man. It's From the Soul was started eight years ago. Me and my friends were playing basketball. I seen a gentleman walking by limping. And I looked down, he had on no shoes and no socks. What size shoe you wear? Nine and a half. Nine and a half? I got you. So I ran up to the gentleman and I said, excuse me, sir, can I ask you what size shoe you wear? He told me to leave him alone, get out of his face. And I said, I'll leave you alone if you just tell me what size you wear. He said the last time he remember he wears size 10. Something in me that I said, how many more less fortunate people are in this city like this gentleman? I gotta look in my closet and see how many sneakers I have. All right, lovely, thank you, family. Thank you. Thank you. I started walking around New York City every day in my closet grabbing sneakers that I didn't even wear, looking for people who wear from 10 to 12 and started providing my sneakers to them. When my sneakers ran out, I started asking all my friends and their family for their sneakers. And then that's how It's From The Soul grow. Can I give you a pair of sneakers for free? Yeah, follow me, please. Try these on for me, please. Some nice, good New Balance, super light, comfortable. What's up? What's going on, man? How are you? Hey, what's up? How's everything? Good, good. All right, give me one second. I'll be with you, okay? We tie their sneakers for them. Help them put their sneakers on. We want them to feel dignity. We want them to feel like they're coming into a sneaker store. You do? Okay. The new 580s? Yeah. So when you step down, it has that cushion in it. That makes it more comfortable. Yeah, I need a car. I just had an operation. Yes, well, bless you, man. Yeah, yeah, bless yeah. you. A lot of the less fortunate people, they don't understand, why would you want to give me something that you probably can sell? So we have to change the narrative and let them know we are here to help. We are not here to get anything from you. All right, yeah, Mildred, yeah. They fit, right? Oh, yeah. yeah, there they go, there you go. The things that I usually complain about, it, this is, shows me that the things that I complain about, they really don't matter. Because now other people are providing for less fortunate and they send us the video, they send us the picture so that we could see that we have inspired them. So now that this organization is growing the way it is, now that people feel the need that they need to give out of their closet or give their resources, it's, it's just an incredible feeling. so crucial for reopening America. A big day yes. around here, a very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them, doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. <laughs> Celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything, for traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. 
Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. <laughs> Celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it. The impact boxing has had on my life has been something that I would have never imagined from when I first started. Boxing has a negative connotation. Typically, we think violence and we think fighting and we think anger, and it's actually the opposite. It teaches you control and release. Boxing has allowed me to take my story and feel strong enough in order to help others start their story, start their process, feel good about themselves. My name is Jessica Margulies. I am a teacher for autistic children for New York City. I also am a trainer at Title Boxing. Welcome to Title Boxing Club. Cross, hook, cross. Good job, back it up. I started Spectrum Bout about five years ago. I started boxing in order to alleviate stress from the job of working with children with special needs. I felt confident, strong, and it hit me. This would be such a great feeling for children with special needs to feel. There's something really structured about boxing. I hit, you hit. I follow a sequence, one, two, three. Children who are on the spectrum love structure. Some kids that could not be coordinated in anything else, parents had told me, as soon as they put on the boxing gloves, it just clicked. Good, Joshua, stay here, stay ready. Jab, jab, cross, jab, jab. Joshua started this. He wanted to do boxing because he's very, whatever way the wind blows, if you will, if something he wants to get into, he'll say, Mom, I'd like to try that. Boxing, it's the sport of combat, and me and my brother are very interesting in it. A way you'll stay fit, strong, and brave. When I tell people I'm teaching kids with autism how to box, I get either a shocked look, um, a nervous look uh, that I would get from parents, a little, I'm not sure about this, um, but a lot of the times I've been getting a positive, loving feedback from this program. I've been working with children with autism for over 11 years now. I worked in a early intervention, so at two years old, um, the kids can get classified. And I just fell in love with everything about it. Kind of like boxing. From the outside, it looks very aggressive, a lot of challenges, but it's actually opposite. I loved the challenge and the hard work and the patience that it took in order to help someone progress through life in a positive way. Joshua is a very engaging individual. He likes to meet people, he likes to engage them in conversation, and he likes to tell them the things he likes to do. My pet lizard name is Frederick. He loves to talk about his dragon lizard. He loves to talk about his favorite foods. He loves to talk about places he's been. My husband and I first found out that there was a problem. I think it was about seven or eight years old. Little did we know at that time, we were going to go down the same road as we did with his older brother, who was already diagnosed with autism. Jabari got the word of being autistic when I was pregnant with Joshua. So we were ultimately able to get Joshua into the same school as his brother. He'll be graduating in June, and we're looking at to what his next step is going to be. So I've seen many changes in him since he started doing boxing. With boxing, he, he developed discipline. If Joshua was mad about something, he would deal with the situation in a way that's probably not appropriate. But since he's been doing boxing, he, he takes time out to analyze the situation first and then you know, express himself rather than just like being upset about it. It's really uh, made him more disciplined, uh, more controlled, and I can see him becoming a man. I always tell parents this program is actually a teaching tool for those aggressive students that don't have an outlet to 
release that aggression and they're holding it in all day or maybe they're acting upon it. But we teach them here, we only hit when our gloves go on. I think he likes engaging with others, the sparring. I think it's given him a sense of confidence as well because he's a lot calmer than what he used to be. The world at times could be a very cruel pace and you're just hopeful that there will be people who will understand our kids and help them. What I'm most proud of of what I've done about this program is giving these kids a voice, an outlet, a place to release, a place to feel accepted and know that they have every right and opportunity that you and I have. They need to feel it's okay to be frustrated, it's okay to not know the answer, it's okay to be scared but they are strong and they deserve every opportunity. And I think I've given them a place to learn all of that. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're gonna do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines, so crucial for reopening America. A big day around here, a very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them, doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring is sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. Oh, we're celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. More Americans watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. first started playing Scrabble in jail, kept my mind off everything, mm -hmm. which really helped me, you know. It just got really, really scary for a while, but I'm just glad I'm out helping other people. You're a miracle man. I'm thankful Yeah. But I made it out on the other side because there's a lot of people that don't. And look at the good Scrabble player you've become. <laughs> My name is Doug Bobst, and I'm from Timonium, Maryland. One, two, three, four. I was 14 five, years old when I first six, started smoking seven, pot. Eight. I remember taking my first hit off a marijuana pipe, and I felt like that any worries, any pain, any fears I had were gone, you know, when I was high. One thing led to the next, and I started doing painkillers, and one five milligram Percocet snowballed into me putting a few hundred milligrams of Oxycontin up my nose every day and really, really going down a path that I thought I was gonna either end up rotting in jail or, or being dead. I got arrested on Cinco de Mayo 2008. I was riding around with a few of my friends to go pick up some Oxycontin and I had a half pound of pot in my trunk, $2,000 in cash, and we were going to make a drug deal to pick up some pills. I see a cop running radar, I flash my high beams thinking that would like prevent him from seeing my busted headlight. And he pulls me over, you know, and one thing led to the next, I'm out of the car, I'm in handcuffs, he searches it, and I knew at that point my life was over. I reported to jail a few weeks later a week after my 21st birthday. I was crying, I was you know, high as a kite on opiates, and I detoxed in their cold turkey for, for several weeks of all the you know, horrible withdrawal symptoms you hear about from opiates. It feels like you're trying to crawl out of your own skin, for one. You're, you're vomiting regularly, you're, you're going to the bathroom regularly, 
you're, you got stuff coming out of you, you, you don't know where it's coming from, you feel like a zombie almost, a lot of pain, a lot of aches, a lot of anxiety. Because for me, I was self-medicating with the opiates. I wanted to numb the pain. I didn't even think about my life anymore. Obviously, there's an opiate epidemic, there's a drug epidemic, but I think there's also like a big mental health epidemic. And I think instead of people you know, raising their hand and saying, hey, I need help, because it's so stigmatized to admit that you have depression or you have anxiety or you have bipolar or whatever, we choose to deal with that in unhealthy ways and easy ways, you know, such as drugs and such as other addictions. So this is a workout routine I got uh, when I was incarcerated and it was from my cellmate. And my cellmate was the one who really helped me, you know, find fitness and got me into working out. And so I wanted to keep this as a good luck charm. So I actually met my cellmate at the Scrabble table. And he was like, what are you doing here, man? He like looked at me, he's like, what's a guy like you doing? And he's like, you don't belong here. I saw him that night working out. And I was like, man, what's this guy doing? He's doing like thousands of push-ups. He's like, you know, running all these laps and doing all these ab exercises. And he was like, you're gonna start working out with me. And I was like, dude, are you serious? Like, there's no way I'm working out. And then one night I was like, you know, what do I have to lose? And I decided to give it a try. And I remember getting down to a push-up. Couldn't do a push-up. Could, couldn't even do one for my knees. <laughs> and with his motivation, training me in there every day and being on me, holding me accountable, giving me a little food plan in there. I was able to do 10 push-ups and run a mile by the time I left jail. And I felt like this, this light bulb go off in my head. And slowly but surely, I ended up losing 40, 50 pounds and getting to a place fitness-wise where I wanted to help other people use fitness to change their lives, and that's what inspired me to become a personal trainer. How are you? Good to see you. Good. What's up? Not much. You ready to work hard? Yep. There you go. One, two, three, four. Really rotate your hips. There you go. One, two, three. We were introduced by someone who's in the recovery community. 20 seconds left, let's go. You know, and I've got some history of my family and stuff like that, so it's nice to kind of own that, be authentic about it, be able to talk to somebody about it, in addition to, you know, the whole fitness thing. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Get some water, all right? Good job, man. I'll see you Sunday, all right? Go. Hey. Dog, how you doing? Good, how are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. How are you? All right. Grandma. Hi, hon. Good to see you. Good to see you. How so are when you? I got out of jail, I went to live with my grandparents. And my grandparents took me in. They had some pretty strict guidelines. They said, you can live here, but we'll, you know, we won't charge you rent. We can, we'll feed you and all that stuff. But, you know, you're going to bring us receipts for any money we give you. You know, you're going to work out. You're going to have a job. You're gonna make your bed, you're gonna be respectful, you're gonna come home. At certain times, you're gonna let us know where you are, and if not, like, you're out. And that was kind of what I needed, was that tough love. I can recall when you came to live with us, it was quite clear at that point that you were focused completely. You, you held up your end of the bargain, and you did well. If I hadn't gotten arrested, I'd be dead. I really would be dead, because I was going down a path that you know, I was snorting enough painkillers to kill a horse, and it was just a really, really bad time in my life. When I was in jail, it was a real big turning point for me, and it really helped me turn a negative into a positive because I had a lot of laughs in there. You know, I remember from when I, where I was when I first got there to where I left, and I saw the transformation, and it just, it's made me who I am today. I'm on fight! I'm on Frank. <laughs> Stuff's still gonna happen because life does happen, but it's like, what kind of tools are you using when that stuff happens? And, you know, going for a run, you know, working out with a friend or going for a walk can all be positive things you can do to feel better about yourself when you're struggling. Hi, 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 all you beautiful people. Thank you for watching your favorite streaming channel and ours today all day.
That's right. We are halfway through week two of these Olympics. I'm in Tokyo. Savannah's out on the plaza there in New York. And you at home watching our little digital show that we call Today in 30. We've got another, another packed half hour full of athletes, full of fun moments.